Chapter 3 In the early haze of dawn the streets of Karaja were thronged by crowds of people who watched the hosts riding from the southern gate. The army was on the move at last. There were the knights, gleaming in richly wrought plate armor, colored plumes waving above their burnished salets. Their steeds, caparisoned with silk, lacquered leather and gold buckles, caracoled and curveted as their riders put them through their paces. The early light struck glints from lance points that rose like a forest above the array, their pennons flowing in the breeze. Each knight wore a lady's token, a glove, scarf or rose, bound to his helmet or fastened to his sword belt. They were the chivalry of Karaja, 500 strong, led by Count Thespides, who, men said, aspired to the hand of Yasmala herself. They were followed by the light cavalry on rangy steeds. The riders were typical hillmen, lean and hawk-faced, peaked steel caps were on their heads and chainmail glinted under their flowing caftans. Their main weapon was the terrible Shemitish bow, which could send a shaft 500 paces. There were 5,000 of these, and Shupras rode at their head, his lean face moody beneath his spired helmet. Close on their heels marched the Karaja spearmen, always comparatively few in any Hyborian state, where men thought cavalry the only honorable branch of service. These, like the knights, were of ancient Kothic blood. Sons of ruined families, broken men, penniless youths, who could not afford horses and plate armor, five hundred of them. The mercenaries brought up the rear, a thousand horsemen, two thousand spearmen. The tall horses of the cavalry seemed hard and savage as their riders, they made no curvettes or gambades. There was a grimly business-like aspect to these professional killers, veterans of bloody campaigns. Clad from head to foot in chainmail, they wore their visorless headpieces over linked coifs. Their shields were unadorned, their long lances without guidance. At their saddlebows hung battle axes or steel maces, and each man wore at his hip a long broadsword. The spearmen were armed in much the same manner, though they bore pikes instead of cavalry lances. They were men of many races and many crimes. There were tall Hyperboreans, gaunt, big-boned, of slow speech and violent natures, tawny-haired gundermen from the hills of the northwest, swaggering Corinthian renegades. Swarthy Dingarians, with bristling black mustaches and fiery tempers, Aquilonians from the distant west. But all, except the Zingarians, were Hyborians. Behind all came a camel in rich housings, led by a knight on a great warhorse, and surrounded by a clump of picked fighters from the royal house troops. Its rider, under the silken canopy of the seat, was a slim, silk-clad figure, at the sight of which the populace, always mindful of royalty, threw up its leather cap and cheered wildly. Conan the Sumerian, restless in his plate armor, stared at the bedecked camel with no great approval, and spoke to Amalric, who rode beside him, resplendent in chainmail threaded with gold. Golden breastplate and helmet with flowing horsehair crest. The princess would go with us. She's supple, but too soft for this work. Anyway, she'll have to get out of these robes. Amalric twisted his yellow mustache to hide a grin. Evidently Conan supposed Yasmala intended to strap on a sword and take part in the actual fighting, as the barbarian women often fought. The women of the Hyborians do not fight like your Cimmerian women, Conan, he said. Yasmala rides with us to watch the battle, anyway. He shifted in his saddle and lowered his voice. Between you and me, I have an idea that the princess dares not remain behind. She fears something. An uprising? Maybe we'd better hang a few citizens before we start. No. One of her maids talked. Babbled about something that came into the palace by night and frightened Yasmela half out of her wits. It's some Natok's deviltry. I doubt not. Kona, it's more than flesh and blood we fight. Well, grunted the Sumerian. It's better to go meet an enemy than to wait for him. Glanced at the long line of wagons and camp followers, gathered the reins in his mailed hand, and spoke from habit the phrase of the marching mercenaries, Hell or plunder, comrades, march. Behind the long train the ponderous gates of Karaja closed. Eager heads lined the battlements. The citizens well knew they were watching life or death go forth. If the host was overthrown, the future of Karaja would be written in blood. In the horde swarming up from the savage south, mercy was a quality unknown.
All day the columns marched, through grassy rolling meadowlands, cut by small rivers, the terrain gradually beginning to slope upward. Ahead of them lay a range of low hills, sweeping in an unbroken rampart from east to west. They camped that night on the northern slopes of those hills, and hook-nosed, fiery-eyed men of the hill tribes came in scores to squat about the fires and repeat news that had come up out of the mysterious desert. Through their tails ran the name of Natok like a crawling serpent. At his bidding the demons of the air brought thunder and wind and fog, the fiends of the underworld shook the earth with awful roaring. He brought fire out of the air and consumed the gates of walled cities, and burnt armored men to bits of charred bone. His warriors covered the desert with their numbers, and he had five thousand Stygian troops in war chariots under the rebel prince Cutaman. Conan listened unperturbed. War was his trade. Life was a continual battle, or series of battles, since his birth. Death had been a constant companion. It stalked horrifically at his side, stood at his shoulder beside the gaming tables, its bony fingers rattled the wine cups. It loomed above him, a hooded and monstrous shadow, when he lay down to sleep. He minded its presence no more than a king minds the presence of his cupbearer. Some day its bony grasp would close, that was all. It was enough that he lived through the present. However, others were less careless of fear than he. Striding back from the sentry lines, Conan halted as a slender cloaked figure stayed him with an outstretched hand. Princess, you should be in your tent. I could not sleep. Her dark eyes were haunted in the shadow. Conan, I am afraid. Are there men in the post you fear? Hand locked on his hilt. No man. She shuddered. Conan, is there anything you fear? He considered, tugging at his chin. I. He admitted at last. The curse of the gods. Again she shuddered. I am cursed. A feat from the abysses has set his mark upon me. Night after night he lurks in the shadows, whispering awful secrets to me. He will drag me down to be his queen in hell. I dare not sleep. He will come to me in my pavilion as he came in the palace. Conan, you are strong keep me with you. I am afraid. She was no longer a princess, but only a terrified girl. Her pride had fallen from her, leaving her unashamed in her nakedness. In her frantic fear she had come to him who seemed strongest ruthless power that had repelled her, drew her now. For answer he drew off his scarlet cloak and wrapped it about her, roughly, as if tenderness of any kind were impossible to him. His iron hand rested for an instant on her slender shoulder, and she shivered again, but not with fear. Like an electric shock a surge of animal vitality swept over her at his mere touch, as if some of his superabundant strength had been imparted to her. Lie here. He indicated a clean-swept space close to a small flickering fire. He saw no incongruity in a princess lying down on the naked ground beside a campfire, wrapped in a warrior's cloak. But she obeyed without question. He seated himself near her on a boulder, his broadsword across his knees. With the firelight glinting from his blue steel armor, he seemed like an image of steel. Dynamic power for the moment quiescent, not resting, but motionless for the instant, awaiting the signal to plunge again into terrific action. The firelight played on his features, making them seem as if carved out of substance shadowy yet hard as steel. They were immobile, but his eyes smoldered with fierce life. He was not merely a wild man, he was part of the wild, one with the untamable elements of life, in his veins ran the blood of the wolf pack. In his brain lurked the brooding depths of the northern night, his heart throbbed with the fire of blazing forests. So, half meditating, half dreaming, Yasmala dropped off to sleep, wrapped in a sense of delicious security. Somehow she knew that no flame-eyed shadow would bend over her in the darkness, with this grim figure from the outland standing guard above her. Yet once again she wakened, to shudder in cosmic fear, though not because of anything she saw. It was a low mutter of voices that roused her. Opening her eyes, she saw that the fire was burning low. The feeling of dawn was in the air. She could dimly see that Conan still sat on the boulder, she glimpsed the long blue glimmer of his blade. Close beside him crouched another figure, on which the dying fire cast a faint glow. Yatmala drowsily made out a hooked beak of a nose, a glittering bead of an eye, under a white turban. The man was speaking rapidly in a Shemite dialect she found hard to understand. Let Bill wither my aunt. I speak truth. I dark it o, Conan. 
I am a prince of liars, but I do not lie to an old comrade. I swear by the days when we were thieves together in the land of Zamora, before you donned hauberk. I saw Nato, with the others I knelt before him when he made incantations to set. But I did not thrust my nose in the sand as the rest did. I am a thief of Shumir, and my sight is keener than a weasel's. I squinted up and saw his whale blowing in the wind. It blew aside, and I saw, I saw, will aid me, Conan, I say I saw. My blood froze in my veins, and my hair stood up. What I had seen burned my soul like a red-hot iron. I could not rest until I had made sure. I journeyed to the ruins of Kutchames. The door of the ivory dome stood open, in the doorway lay a great serpent, transfixed by a sword. Within the dome lay the body of a man, so shriveled and distorted I could scarce make it out at first, it was Shevitas, the Zamorian, the only thief in the world I acknowledged as my superior. The treasure was untouched, it lay in shimmering heaps about the courts. That was all. There were no bones. Began Conan. There was nothing. Broke in the Shemite passionately. Nothing. Only the one corpse. Silence reigned an instant, and Yasmola shrank with a crawling nameless horror. Whence came Nato? Rose the Shemite's vibrant whisper. Out of the desert on a night when the world was blind and wild with mad clouds driven in frenzied flight across the shuddering stars. And the howling of the wind was mingled with the shrieking of the spirits of the wastes. Vampires were abroad that night, witches rode naked on the wind, and werewolves howled across the wilderness. On a black camel he came, riding like the wind, and an unholy fire played about him, the cloven tracks of the camel glowed in the darkness. When Natu dismounted before Set's shrine by the oasis of Afka, the beast swept into the night and vanished. And I have talked with tribesmen, who swore that it suddenly spread gigantic wings and rushed upwards into the clouds, leaving a trail of fire behind it. No man has seen that camel since that night, but a black brutish man-like shape shambles to Nato's tent and gibbers to him in the blackness before dawn. I will tell you, Conan, Nato is, look, I will show you an image of what I saw that day by Shushan when the wind blew aside his way. Yasmala saw the glint of gold in the Shemite's hand, as the men bent closely over something. She heard Conan grunt, and suddenly blackness rolled over her. For the first time in her life, Princess Yasmala had fainted.